Okay. So I've just put up the, uh, the intro screen here and uh, we welcome to everybody that's joining our event tonight. So as usual, uh, our event is being shared with other astronomy clubs across the north of Scotland. So welcome to all the, the members that are joining from those clubs via uh, Zoom. And tonight as well, we are live streaming the, the event onto our Facebook page. So for those that have uh, joined uh, via Facebook, uh, probably predominantly non-members that are joining, I, I hope you enjoy the, uh, the, the event tonight. We'll shortly be kicking off uh, live streaming and, the, the event onto our Facebook page. No, I'm, I'm getting a bit of feedback there, so, so sorry about that, that sounds a bit confusing. Uh, so we will be streaming the event onto the, uh, the Facebook page. Uh, welcome to anybody that's watching from there. If I can ask uh, everybody to mute their mics uh, that's joining via Zoom, that would be much appreciated. Andy, uh, I'll be handing over to you shortly, so it's up to yourself whether you want to uh, mute or not. Uh, the means of asking questions tonight, it's probably best if you can use the chat function on uh, Zoom meeting for doing that. So as the, uh, the presentation goes ahead, uh, that Andy will be giving, if you want to put any questions you have into the chat, we'll go through them at the end of the, the presentation. The event tonight is going to be in two parts. Uh, the, the first part will be Andy's uh, presentation, and then at the end, I will give a, a short run through of some images taken by members over the past year. Uh, when we get to that stage, uh, we, we, we might just uh, allow people to jump in and unmute themselves uh, if they'll get any queries. But certainly for, for the main presentation, if I can ask you to mute your mics and pop any questions you have for Andy Lawrence into the, the Q&A part of a uh, Zoom meeting. The, the other thing to, to point out is that we are uh, streaming this live onto Facebook. So if you don't want your face to appear, you might want to uh, uh, turn off your video feed at the moment. Uh, so uh, feel, feel free to, to do that if you want to. But, uh, but please uh, mute your mic if you don't mind. Okay, so how are we doing for time? I think we're... Uh, we're just after half past, so we'll, we'll make a start now. So welcome to tonight's event, uh, hosted by Case Ness Astronomy Group. And the, the main part of tonight's event will be a presentation by Professor Andy Worms, uh, the sky on the sky, why it matters, and how we might lose it. But just before I introduce Andy and pass over to him for the uh, for the main feature, I will run through uh, a few updates. Uh, point I still have a captive audience rather than doing this at the end. I'll, I'll do the updates just now. So future online events that are planned uh, in just over a month's time, uh, KTS Astronomy Group will have its next event, uh, and that will be a presentation by myself uh, and this will be a members event, so it, will, it, it won't be streamed live to the public. It will be purely to KTS Astronomy Group and other North of Scotland Astronomy Club members. And the, the presentation that night will be on lunar observing. The more you look, the more you see. Now, I, I will point out I stole uh, that, that little phrase there from a certain Dave Davidson from uh, Highland Astronomical Society. I don't know if you're, uh, you're tuning in tonight, Dave, but thanks very much uh, for that. I, I remember uh, a month or two back, yourself and Eric were doing tours of the moon live streamed and uh, 
you, you used that phrase and I thought it's absolutely perfect for anybody that observes the moon. Uh, the, the, the more you look at it, the, the more detail you can pick out. Uh, and that's going to be the, the, the main upshot of the, uh, the presentation that night. A little bit more on that in the next slide. Uh, and then on Thursday the 10th of June, uh, we're aiming to have a public event to live stream the partial solar eclipse that will be happening that morning. Now, clearly, that is weather permitting. So uh, if you keep an eye on our uh, website and Facebook pages nearer the time, that will give an idea as to whether that is likely under the uh, forecast weather conditions. And there will be more events to follow over the summer, including a few that are going to be open to the public to attend via Facebook as well. So, as I said, uh, the, the next event in May, uh, we'll be looking at lunar observing. So I'll be talking about a lot of the interesting features that you can see in the moon or image on the moon using fairly uh, simple amateur equipment. Uh, so if, for some reason it's, uh, bear with me, I seem to have froze, there we go. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more about uh, all, all of these sort of things, or if you find yourself getting confused at times between your rills, your grabbing, and your wrinkle ridges, then uh, uh, the yes, that probably. night will hopefully yeah. be uh, useful oh. to you. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So. Okay. Now, I'm just going to uh, do the introduction for uh, Andy now. Uh, and just before I hand over to Andy, if I can just remind anybody that's forgot to mute their their mic on their uh, uh, their Zoom settings, if you can maybe do that for us, that's great. Thank you. So, uh, Andy Lawrence, uh, he's the Regius Professor of Astronomy at the Institute for Astronomy, uh, which is in the University of Edinburgh, and tonight we're delighted that he's going to give a talk on the sky, why it matters, and how we might lose it. Uh, now, uh, he has a, a book out at the moment, uh, which I'm most of the way through, and I, I personally have found it very interesting, so uh, I'm, I'm sure there'll be plenty of others within the, the audience that would uh, find it interesting as well. Uh, Andy may well mention it further, but it's readily available uh, and you can get it through Amazon and uh, also through uh, Google and various other outlets. Uh, and you'll probably touch a little bit upon uh, uh, some of the, the, the information that's covered in that during his presentation. But a little bit more on Andy uh, as we have introdu uh, introduction. He his specialist topic is active galactic nuclei, and you'll see a summary of the academic uh, publications there in the bottom right hand side of the screen. Now, that is quite an impressive list. Uh, I think you'll, you'll all agree. And I came across something uh, produced by Stuart Lowe. I suspect a, a lot of you as astronomers will be familiar with the HR diagram. And he, he decided to, to try and use it to uh, pick out uh, who the stars are when it comes to uh, astronomy. And uh, you, you, you'll see he tried to lead it, lay it out a bit like in the uh, HR uh, diagram uh, arrangement. And no, not surprisingly, uh, there's a group of media stars up the top, all, all the ones that you regularly see on uh, uh, TV programmes. And then you have the, the academic giants in the, uh, the top sort of left-hand corner, where you have the, the people there that are making major contributions and uh, doing lots of academic uh, important academic work, and you'll recognise some of the, the names in there, I'm sure, 
uh, Lord Martin Rees, the Astronomer Royal, Professor Jocelyn Bell. And of course, the reason why I'm highlighting this is Andy's up there in that list and amongst it. Uh, so I, th I think uh, uh, this is quite a good illustration for those that might not appreciate just how Im impressive these numbers are in the bottom left hand side. Uh, he has done a lot over his uh, uh, astronomical career. Uh, and it's great that we are able to invite him back uh, because he was in Case Ness a number of years ago. Uh, he gave a number of talks for us over a few days. He visited uh, several of the local schools and you can see in the photographs there uh, that there was big audiences. And uh, I, I suspect, he didn't, he's, he's probably not received as many questions, taxing questions uh, at uh, a, a professional conferences as he did on those couple of days from the, the school kids. Uh, he, he clearly uh, uh, generated a lot of interest uh, because I, I remember standing at the back of the, the room uh, feeling a bit sorry for him with the number of questions we were getting bombarded with. Uh, and they were all excellent questions as well. So it's great to be able to invite Andy back. Uh, I, I should also point out that since then, I have actually seen him uh, more recently, not in the person, but online, uh, because he, he has a, a, an online astronomy course uh, that I, th I think is still available at the moment. Uh, and for those that are interested in these sort of things, I can recommend that as well. Uh, now, if I'm, I'm going to stop uh, sounding a bit like his press officer now and hand over to Andy for his presentation. Uh, so I'll stop sharing just now if you're ready, Andy, to uh, to take over. Uh, I will. Thank you very much, Gordon, for that effusive introduction. I hope I can live up to it now. And uh, it was, it's, you're absolutely right. The, um, the school kids really grill you hard. Uh, you know, but it's it's, <laughs> it's very worthwhile. So um, I'm just sorry I can't be in Caithness again. It's a very beautiful place, and you're you're a great society. You know, um, so it's, um, and um, it's, a, it's a shame shame not to drink some beer with you. So you know, there we go. Anyway, let's get my talk going for you. So I'm going to share my screen, and we have this one. Yep, now I'm going to put it full screen. All right, so you should be seeing my first slide here with this just got the title on and, and the date, basically. Um, the sky, why it matters and how we might lose it. Um, so let's dive into it. I've, I think in principle, this should be about 45 minutes. Let's, but let's just see. Um, so this talk's gonna come in three parts. Can I just check, are you all seeing and hearing me okay? Is it fine? Yeah, yeah, I'm hearing you fine, Andy. Jolly good. Right. So this talk is coming in three parts. Part one, um, is astronomy useless? Part two, the threat to the sky. Um, so having established, as you can expect, that the, by the end of part one, that um, astronomy matters. OK, so part two, why is it under threat? And part three, what can we do? So let's dive in. So um, here are some pictures um, out of my career. So I've spent several decades studying um, galaxies and active galactic nuclei and surveying the sky, making maps. And astronomy, as you know, both at the professional level and the amateur level is full of beautiful pictures and absolutely fascinating things. And, and we all love it. But you might think, yeah, yeah, but um, that's good. It's lovely, you know, but it's, it's kind of useless, isn't it? I mean, you know, compared to, uh, you know, saving the world from the pandemic or you know, a climate change or even just everyday things like, you know, understanding astronomy doesn't get your car fixed and the dinner cooked, you know, so isn't it just a kind of nice luxury? Well, hopefully I'm going to convince you that that is not the case and, we, and so we can all feel better because we all love astronomy. So let's dive into that. So part one, is astronomy useless? Well the answer is no, um, but I'm going to step through for you um, a number of reasons why this is the case. I, I hope by the way 
that um, as well as being of interest, um, as Astro fans, all of you, um, this sort of thing can be quite useful. You know, when you get into um, uh, arguments with your relatives or your friends in the pub or whatever, you know, it's good to be armed with these things. Right, first of all, um, through history, um, astronomy has been of very direct importance. Uh, so first of all, agriculture. In order to plant crops, you, know, you need to know when to sow, when to reap, um, etc. And to do that, you've got to be able to predict um, how the seasons are going to change. And the only way you could do that uh, through history was by studying the sky watching uh, not just the, uh, the sun, but also you know, the stars and the moon, and you build up the calendar. So this, of course, was absolutely vital to the development of humanity. Uh, observing the sky was all about survival. Um, okay, this won't be so popular in modern times, but divination, right? So I know we all think, oh, uh, mumbo jumbo, right? But it is undeniable that it was absolutely crucial in the development of civilization the desire to try and understand and predict the future. It's a kind of proto-science in a way. We know how to do it better now, but it was about trying to understand things, predict and control things. Uh, and so of course, observing the sky and the way things change was crucial to that. Now you might be asking, why is there a picture of the Crab Nebula there? Uh, that's because the Crab Nebula was left behind uh, uh, by the explosion of a supernova in 1054, which was observed by Chinese astronomers um, uh, 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 as, as a guest star, as they called it. And when things like that, when things changed in the sky, they saw it of great um, uh, mystical importance, you know, and the emperor had to know, and it portended something. Uh, and so that was very important. Uh, next thing, uh, navigation. Again, through all of history, but certainly up to very recent times. Uh, in order to explore the world, to know where you were at sea, you had to know your latitude and your longitude. Um, so latitude is relatively easy. easy. Um, and there is my good old chum, Alistair Bruce, pretending to be Charles Piazzi Smythe, using a sextant, um, as you would on a boat. Uh, uh, and so together with a knowledge of the stars and the sextant, you could know your latitude. And then, of course, to get longitude, uh, well, somehow the Polynesians did it anyway, but in modern times, we had to have accurate timepieces that would still work on a boat, even though the boat was rocking about. And that's the famous Harrison clock that um, solved that problem in the 18th century. So it was about exploring the world. Time. So, you know, modern civilization is built on an accurate sense of time, not just the seasons in that kind of crude sense, as in that first slide, um, but right down to the minute and the second. Uh, there's a train there, because of course the great 19th century thing was realizing that it, if the infrastructure of transport and trains was gonna work, you had to know not just what's the local time, but what is the time in Bristol? What is the time in Aberdeen? Uh, you had to know these things. And to do that, you needed astronomers. You would have clocks, but the clocks were calibrated against the only reliable clock, which was the sky. So astronomers um, were paid by the government to uh, use their transit circles and observe the stars and calibrate their clocks. Uh, and that picture on the left is one taken by me of the uh, Nelson Monument in Edinburgh with the time ball. Uh, again, good old Charles Piazzi Smythe set that up in um, 1860, 1853, uh, which uh, drops at one o'clock. So you could all set your timepieces. Okay, so that's the big historical things. Now, some of those are, you think were well, no longer necessary because we've got atomic clocks, we can navigate with GPS satellites, so, so that's all gone away. But astronomy remains, uh, and the study of the sky and its contents, let's say, remains important in modern times. So firstly, I'm gonna talk about um, the, the role of astronomy um, uh, in, in society at large. So firstly, it's a sense of perspective, which I think is important for everybody. So top left there is the, is the earth, of course, and then in the middle is the sun. And the sun is really a lot bigger than the earth. And bottom right, there is a very nice model. Um, I, I, so I can't actually remember who made this, uh, but I've still got the picture on my laptop. Um, but that is an accurate rendition of how many earths could fit inside the sun with little polystyrene balls. 
and it makes you realize that even though the world seems enormous because it takes so long to get to Tokyo, it's trivial compared to the sun. Stepping out, you know, the nearest stars, there's the, the plow, um, uh, you know, so you get a sense of the, the neighborhood that you live in. Uh, on the right there is a picture taken by your very own Gordon Mackey, one of my favorite pictures of the Milky Way. Um, and you know, observing the Milky Way, I find it's very important because you see this strip um, across the sky and you realize that you, you live inside a disk of stars. And it, it, when you stare at the Milky Way, you could just feel that physically. You think, yeah, that's where I live, inside this thing. Um, and down the bottom there is um, uh, our modern infrared survey of the Milky Way. And in the next slide, um, I'm just gonna, if this movie works, I'm gonna uh, pan across some of our database, um, just a tiny fraction of it. And that gives you a feel of just how many stars there are in the Milky Way. It goes on and on and on. Um, so that gives you a sense of scale. So all these things are, I think, important to humanity to have that sense of perspective. Um, but it's more than that. It is, of course, as we know, and thinking of those school kids, those lovely pictures that Gordon showed us just now. I, I can't, 2013, I can't believe it was that long ago, but there we go. Um, um, inspiration. So talking to school kids, um, you know, letting them do experiments with light. Um, the, the, um, that, the thing on the left, that's Catherine Heyman. So you really must get for a talk sometime if you haven't already. Catherine's really good. And here she is, one of our ROE open days. Um, and children make a sort of um, glue and glitter uh, uh, sort of uh, main sequence HR diagram of stars. I think that's actually, no, that's a collection of galaxies. But anyway, it's inspiring children. But it's not just when they're children, a key role of astronomy is training. So the thing is, you know, the objects that we study may be stars and galaxies and, and quasars out there in the depths of the universe. But in terms of our subject matter, our skills, we're physicists. So we use astronomy to teach physics. Uh, and of all the people we teach, only a very small fraction end up becoming astronomers. Uh, but they all they become other types of physicists or they go into industry or they or they work for finance companies, whatever, but they, they're trained um, uh, by us. Uh, at the top there, that's um, uh, one of my um, PhD students. And in the middle, that's um, the William Herschel Telescope in, in La Palma. Uh, so training. OK, so that's general importance to society. Um, but um, astronomy also plays a key role within science and technology. It's not just kind of uh, abstract and cute bit of, of science. It's right there in the core of our modern understanding of the physical world. Let me just give you two examples. The classic one, that is going back a little bit in time, but is absolutely crucial. Um, so our, our understanding of the modern world, much of engineering, uh, of you know, calculations, uh, of how things work, uh, the, the, the scientific and technological understanding of the modern world is, of course, based on Newtonian physics. Where did Newtonian physics come from? Um, it didn't really come from um, Isaac Newton washing the apple drop. It came from him worrying about the moon and the orbit of the moon. And he, but he thought, well, if there's a universal force, and it is the same for this apple and the moon, uh, and it's a universal force, I should be able to explain the orbit of the moon. So to know whether his theory was right, it was all about explaining the motion of, of the moon. So uh, observation of the, of the sky was crucial to the, the development of the core of modern physics. But this is true in the 20th and 21st century as well. Uh, so there's the sun. How does the sun and other stars shine? How do they do it? Uh, that problem was solved in, in parallel through the 1920s, 30s, 40s, um, in, uh, in our understanding of atomic physics and quantum mechanics. Okay, um, Without that, you can't understand how the, uh, uh, the sun shines. Uh, and of course, a lot of the modern world 
um, is based on atomic physics and quantum mechanics, not just um, uh, bombs and nuclear fusion, but uh, the way transistors work. Uh, this is all based on our understanding of quantum mechanics, which we would not have arrived at if we weren't trying to understand the sun, um, amongst other things. Okay. So, um, again, in the 20th century, um, you know, uh, astronomy was absolutely core to the whole of science and technology. So what about now? You might think, well, you know, the things that we're fascinated by now, um, uh, black holes, dark energy, dark matter, you think, okay, no, surely now this just, it's re oh, we all love that stuff. It's really fascinating. But now we are getting useless, aren't we? You know, and well, I wouldn't bet on it. OK, because we don't know. Remember that famous quote of Faraday that, you know, he said, you know, what use is a newborn baby? Right. And um, these things take a long time to filter through. Um, good modern governments understand this, which is why they're mostly um, happy to keep paying us. Because the payoff can take quite a long time. So it's really quite likely that sometime understanding dark matter and dark energy is going to be crucial to the technology of the future. OK, but it's not just about the intellectual understanding of um, uh, science and technology. Uh, there's a good argument to make that astronomy is of direct importance to the economy. Uh, so let me show you why. So firstly, you know, when we do these hugely expensive projects um, like the Hubble Space Telescope or uh, uh, James Webb Space Telescope when it's launched, which where everybody's getting very excited about and waiting for, you know, they're billion dollar projects. OK, uh, which, of course, you know, means they have to be shared across lots of countries because that's, uh, you know, it's not a lot of money to, uh, to the MOD, but it's a lot of money to us. Um, and now, when we have a big project like that, a telescope or a satellite, uh, where does that money go? It doesn't, go, it doesn't pay the salaries of people like me. Um, uh, my salary is paid because I teach and the, so it's the training part. That's where my salary comes from. Um, most of that money goes into contracts. It goes back out to the people who build the telescopes, who, who blast the top of mountains and put things there, who build the rockets that we launch things on. It goes out in contracts. And as any good government knows, again, it's all part of investing in, in a high tech economy, um, which is what you know, a good modern society needs. Um, and as well as just handing government money out to, to industry, we're very demanding customers, which I think is very important. So look, top left there, there's, there's an example um, from the Chandra X-ray Observatory, which had an X-ray grating. But to make an, a, a grating work and get spectra um, in the X-rays, you need incredibly fine grating. So you know the Chandra guys went along to industry and said, well, we want, um, we want a grating. We want the gap between the rulings on the gratings to be about 100 nanometers. Uh, and um, industry said, what? <laughs> Never done that before. Uh, oh, no, all right, give it a go. We'll give it a go. And so they did. And now then quite often those difficult things that we challenge industry with um, are then useful. This is why companies are willing to do it because they develop things that they then can perfect as products and apply elsewhere. Um, similarly, the, um, uh, the LISA Pathfinder satellite, eventually going to be about gravitational waves when the real LISA flies, um, is about high precision station keeping, the ability to have satellites that keep exactly the same distance apart. Uh, and that's going to be important for all sorts of other applications. But it's astronomers coming along saying, can you do this for us? You know, so we're demanding customers. Uh, we're also early adopters. Um, so uh, CCDs and the World Wide Web, two good examples. So we didn't invent those, but pretty much as soon as somebody had invented them, we were going, oh, oh, can I have one of those? I, I think that's just what I need. You know, um, so the, about the third website ever was at the European Southern Observatory uh, back in the early 90s, I think. You know, and I was sending emails in 1983 from OVAX 11730. Um, so we're early adopters. Um, but sometimes it's not just about being demanding. Sometimes we actually invent things and they spin out. Um, so a really good example is Wi-Fi. 
Uh, now, astronomers didn't um, complete the event Wi-Fi. It was put together from several different technological strands. But a key component of some of the Wi-Fi technology came out of radio astronomy and the radio astronomers trying to figure out how to get signals between their stations uh, very fast, uh, particularly by that guy there, John O'Sullivan. Uh, an example much closer to the home, um, up at the observatory uh, in Edinburgh, um, we got very, I say we, this is um, Alan Heavens in particular, who's now in London, very expert in, in data compression to try and solve problems in galaxy surveys. Uh, but now there's a, there's a spin-out company that uses that same technology uh, in medical imaging. Uh, so again, in the future, you know, who knows what's coming next? So um, uh, people in astronomical labs are working on kinetic induction detectors. I, I won't try to explain what they are just now, but that's my bet of what could be the, uh, the next big thing. Uh, and finally, in this section, um, uh, planetary protection is becoming increasingly important. Um, so, killer rocks. Okay, so um, up the top there, there's a fireball uh, snapped by, um, uh, I'm not sure actually if Paola Castillo uh, was an amateur astronomer or just some random citizen, but beautifully captured that. And down the bottom there, we see Meteor Crater, which, as we know, was caused somewhere in the past by something rather, rather big that hit the Earth. So we know these things happen. We're very worried about it because you know, they, they could be civilization threatening events. So we want to know when they're gonna happen. And to do that, we've got to try and catalog all the things, all the bits of rock that are, that, that are near the earth. So how do you do that? You do that with wide field survey telescopes uh, like PanStars there, which I've uh, used for many years. And soon in the future, the Rubin Observatory, which is one of the things that I'm working on now amongst many other people. Um, so uh, to get the point of um, spotting a near-Earth asteroid is this little gif. So you seeing that okay? Um, you see there's a, a wee dot moving through the stars. And that is asteroid 2004FH. I think that's not actually a near-Earth object. It's, it's, um, I think that's the main belt asteroid. I'm not quite, maybe somebody here knows. Um, now, um, so you spot these things by seeing things that are moving in the sky. Now, this particular one was already known, so it's tracked. So what was doing happening here was it's a movie and uh, the telescope is, is tracking, so it keeps the, the asteroid in the center. And because of that, of course, the stars are drifting past. Now you can imagine if you're looking at ones that you don't know, you, you take stationary pictures and the stars are still, and then that faint thing there would be a streak across the image. Now, you also see here, uh, any moment now, there, you saw something flashing past. Uh, that was a satellite. Okay, and that brings us neatly on to the next part of the, of, the, of the talk. We've always seen some satellites, but things are going crazy. Right, so that was part one. Um, uh, I hope you liked it. This is why the sky matters right astronomy really does matter it's not just fun for a few people it's something that's Im important um i think and, and i include amateur astronomy and professional astronomy in that so uh, what's the problem what's gonna gonna happen okay so um i think this audience i hardly need to tell you that you know over the last year or so we've repeatedly seen our pictures uh photobombed by streaks across them like this one here from the dark energy survey camera or bottom right there, there's a colleague of mine um, in Chile working on the uh, Rubin Observatory, which is being built now. Uh, and he was taking a selfie with his uh, phone uh, camera in, um, uh, in astro mode. Uh, and he was photobombed by a satellite while he was taking that selfie. Um, um, so this is happening more and more, these streaks across our images and it's caused by satellites. And in particular, as you can see from the logo, I'll put it across the top there, um, the Starlink satellites um, of Elon Musk's SpaceX company. Um, so it's not just professional images, it's, uh, it's amateur images too. This is a very beautiful image um, uh, taken by Raphael uh, Schmoll, who's a Hungarian astrophotographer. Um, what you're seeing there is Albirio um, or Beta Cygni. Uh, and it, 
those amazing um, starlit uh, streaks going across it. Looks as if Alberio's in prison, right? Uh, now it's a beautiful picture, but of course it's actually not very good news. Last night, I just this morning, I just got this in an email from Andrew Farrow, who some of you will know um, from our own uh, uh, Astronomical Society of Edinburgh, uh, and he several of his pictures he was trying to take last night were photobombed Starlink satellites, uh, and there's there's one of them. So this is literally last night, and Andrew was very cross because um, it you know ruined a picture he was trying to build up to get a deep image. Um, so it's happening more and more. Um, it, it doesn't help going to space, as a lot of the uh, the Musk fanboys on Twitter will tell you, well, astronomy is just going to be done in space from now on. Uh, well, no, that top there, that's an image from the Hubble Space Telescope. And a Starlink satellite just went, Phew! and of course, it was actually quite close. When I say close, a few hundred kilometers, but, you know, pretty damn close. And so that made that big fat streak that you know, wiped out a significant fraction of the image, including the middle, which is the bit they were looking at. You may think, well, OK, maybe we just have to do radio astronomy. Now, that doesn't work either because um, or these satellites, the point is, as we'll talk about in a moment, they're trying to um, uh, uh, make Internet connections. So they're, um, they need radio signals going down to Earth uh, to make those Internet connections. So they are billions of times louder than the things that radio astronomers are trying to see with big telescopes. Um, and, and of course, you know, the, the, the thing is, uh, you know, radio telescopes um, have side lobes. So that um, it's a bit like, e even if you're pointing over here and there's no satellite there, something over here that's very bright will kind of blind you out the corner of your eye, as it, as it were. So it's very bad for radio astronomy as well. Um, okay, so look, there's always been satellites, as we know, and the occasional streak. So why is it a problem? The thing is, it's really suddenly taking off. The number of satellites has been growing steadily over the years, of course. Um, by late 2019, there were about 2,000 active satellites um, in the whole sky. Uh, by the end of 2020, that number was 3,000. Uh, and you can see in that um, uh, graph bottom right, nearly all the increase was due to Starlink satellites launched by SpaceX. Uh, and you know, top left there, that's just an artist's impression of all, all the satellites um, uh, zooming around the, around the Earth. So it's really taking off. Now, the thing is, actually, since this happened, um, astronomers have been speaking to the SpaceX people a fair bit. And they're kind of, while they're determined to do their thing and put up thousands of satellites, oh, by the way, put this in perspective, you know, so now that's an extra thousand. They have permission to send up 12,000 uh, and their intention is to send up 42,000. OK, so it's going to be enormous numbers. Um, and um, the thing is, it's not just them. So they they've tried to help. They painted one of their satellites black, uh, black to see if that helped. And, you know, they've done a few things and it makes things a little bit better. But we have at least been speaking to them. But the real trouble is that everybody else is getting this game. Suddenly commercial space is taking off and the idea of low earth orbit constellations is just going crazy. Uh, so it's not just Starlink, it's uh, OneWeb, Telesat, um, Amazon, uh, Facebook, uh, you know, Chinese and Russian companies. Um, it, it's, it's just, and it's just every couple of weeks I read about somebody new saying, well, we're gonna have a constellation. Um, now, about a year ago, so this could be even worse by now, about a year ago, uh, it was um, a company called AGI in the US who went through all the filings to various regulatory bodies to try and work out how many satellites were planned for the future. Uh, and if they're all approved, by 2029, there will be 107,000. Now, um, if that's the case, then that means by 2029, and I'll tell you, this could be even worse, okay? Um, if suppose you're looking through a pair of binoculars with a typical binocular field of view um, at, at, a, at a typical time, and it depends a little bit whether it's the middle of the night or twilight and on your latitude and so on. But roughly speaking, every time you look through a pair of binoculars, there'll be 10 satellites in your field of view. 
and they'll take about 30 seconds to go across. So I'm assuming they're like a seven degree field of view for typical pair of binoculars. Uh, and likewise, in a Rubin observatory image, a wide field image uh, that's a couple of degrees across, uh, and uh, maybe a you know sort of ten second exposure or something, there'll be ten streaks in every Rubin observatory image. And for the radio astronomers, in in the sky overhead, there'll be hundreds at any one time. Um, so this could get really bad. Uh, and of course, the, the thing that's even more worrying, we, this is not happening yet, but the thing is because of the lack of regulation, and the danger is that this might happen, is a advertising in the sky. So this all ha already happens with drones, of course, um, but at least in airspace, there are, there are some regulations. So you can't just do anything you like, but it's gonna be so tempting to some people to put up lots of satellites to make a pattern in the sky in low earth orbit, uh, because then, Loads of people can see your advertising, uh, millions of people at once. Um, so that may be a bit of a scare story or may not, you know, because who knows what's going to happen. Uh, finally, it's not just about the streaks, the, the light pollution, it's about debris as well. So the number of bits up in space is uh, uh, 10 times larger than the number of active satellites. Leftover rocket stages, smashed up bits, flakes of paint. Um, and that number of about 20,000 is down to 10 centimeters, which is all that NASA and ESA can manage to track. But there's actually been many, many more bits than that. And that's also been growing over time. And the danger is that's going to hit a runaway uh, sometime soon uh, and make use of space by anybody, whether it's you know science or commercial or whatever, it's going to make it unsustainable. So. Um, it, it, it's, it's a pretty, and in the last year or so, there's been two very close misses um, uh, between um, uh, um, uh, SpaceX satellites, one between SpaceX and one web, one web, and one between SpaceX and an ESA satellite. Uh, some quite scary close misses. Now, um, you'll have heard that um, this is um, all about connecting up the world giving internet to everybody. So this is the PR that you, you hear. Um, it's for those poor Africans, you know, or people in rural America who haven't got good internet. It's about connect, making sure everybody's got internet. Well, that's a bit misleading because as I'll stress in a moment, you don't need to do this in order to give everybody internet. What it's really about is, um, well, the technical term is latency, um, but it, it's delay time. It's really about, um, well, a few things, but in particular, high frequency trading, sending signals between fin finance data centers and banks, uh, you know, between London uh, and, uh, and New York or between San Francisco and Tokyo. Uh, but it's also about gaming over the, over the internet. So these are two things where you want things to be, ideally to be at the minimum possible delay. In the one hand, because if you shave off a few milliseconds, you can stand to make millions of dollars and beat your competitors. And in the other case, so that you can have a smooth experience fighting your foes in League of Legends or whatever um, with somebody on the other side of the world. Okay, so um, let me try and explain this with a couple of diagrams. So, you know, we've had communication satellites for many, many years. Most of them so far have been quite in quite high orbits, as you can see in this upper diagram. Uh, by the way, if I waggle my cursor, can you see that okay? Can you see the cursor? Yeah, it's clear, Andy. Okay. So, so here is it mostly in so-called geostationary orbit. Um, there are some now in kind of middling orbits. Um, and the good thing about being in a very high orbit like that is that you can see most of the Earth in one go or half of it in one go. Um, so it's easy to communicate with anybody. Um, but it does mean that signals take a little bit of time because of the finite speed of light to get down to the Earth from geostationary orbit down to the surface of the Earth. It's about 120 milliseconds. So, you know, not a lot, but something. But if you're in low Earth orbit, uh, and now this here, this is about meant to be 500 kilometers about where the, the Starlink satellites here. And this is about 1200 where the, the OneWeb satellites are. Um, so you can have a delay down to the ground of a few milliseconds. Uh, and that makes it short enough that, for instance, you, your total connection time can be faster than the undersea cables 
that people use at the moment. But there's a snag when you do that to have this very short time delay, you can only see a little bit of the earth in one go. So for this to work and join everything up, you have to have thousands of satellites covering the whole globe. So that's where the problem comes from. It's not driven by we want to connect everybody up because you can do that. And other you know, companies like these two companies here, we're already doing this. And obviously, it's a very noble and wonderful thing to give everybody internet if we can, but there are other ways to do it. But if you specifically want the shortest possible time delay uh, for particular reasons, then you want these vast fleets of satellites. And that's where we hit our problem. So this is a kind of environmental catastrophe, I think. Um, so we all know about light pollution. OK, and, and last week was International Dark Sky Week. Um, I'm sure you all know. And uh, we all know that, you know, dark skies are um, outside the, uh, um, the knowledge of a large fraction of humanity now. And so, you know, sometimes, you know, you're lucky to live in Caithness and see the Aurora and so on. Here is a picture from um, Mount Wilson, famous Californian observatory, where many great discoveries were made. It's useless now. These are the lights of Los Angeles, and there's also a forest fire there. So it's a kind of double environmental catastrophe here. And of course, you can just see nothing in that sky. Now, that, however, you know, if you can at least go somewhere else dark, you can be lucky enough to live in Caithness, or um, we can put our telescopes in Hawaii or Chile uh, in order to get away from that rubbish. So the thing about the, uh, the satellite pollution is there is no getting away from it, it's global. Um, you launch some satellites in, uh, in California, and an hour later, they're flying over France. And the, the astronomer in France, whether amateur or professional, goes, you, what? Who said you could do that? Which is very much the, uh, the, the, the point. Uh, and so they're both classic, although, you know, obviously this is not as bad a thing for humanity as say, climate change or loss of biodiversity, but I see it as very much the same thing. It's an environmental problem that's so, as the sort of tragedy of the commons. You think, well, space is free, let's just get up there and do it, right? But, but then you're deflecting the cost of that onto people that you didn't ask. That's, that's the problem and why they're actually very similar. And climate change and satellite pollution are, are very closely related. Okay, so um, having uh, cheered you up by saying how important and wonderful astronomy is, and then depressed you by saying, we're hitting the problem, guys. <laughs> um, what can we do about this? Okay. So option number one, roll over. You could say, well, yeah, I know it's very sad, but look, this is the way of the world. You know, um, with these big financial forces, people want to play League of Legends, etc. You know, this, you know, tough. Uh, but I hope that's not your attitude. Uh, and it certainly isn't mine. Uh, we can protest. Now, this is where uh, partly where the, my book comes in, um, uh, because I know I wrote it to be you know, a popular non-technical book um, and with the idea, not just that you, know, you, you guys can, can read it, um, but that you know, your, your auntie and your hairdresser can read it or, you know, or you know, any sort of educated reader because I think this problem ought to be better. It's very well known amongst astronomers, um, but it's not well enough known amongst the general public, I think. Um, so that was my idea in writing this book. So because of it, well, it's, it's very cheap, as well as hopefully quite good. So, you know, the ebook is one ninety nine, and the paperback is five ninety nine. So um, uh, just get stuck in there and uh, uh, read it if you'd like to. I hope you will enjoy it, but, you know, but recommend it to your auntie and your hairdresser. That's what I really want. Um, there's also a couple of uh, um, uh, petitions going on. So one of which is intended for uh, professional astronomers, this uh, one here, and one of which is intended for the general public. Um, and both of them took off very fast and then sort of flattened off a bit. And so I hope they're gonna pick up again and um, uh, we can get some fuss going about this. So that should be done, but it's not, as we know, making protests doesn't really fix things. The next possibility is what you might call it engage and mitigate. So this is what most of, um, uh, of uh, 
amongst my colleagues of professional astronomers, this is the most common um, approach at the moment. So a number of people uh, have set up and joined working groups uh, set up by the International Astro Astronomical Union, by the Royal Astronomical Society, by the American Astronomical Society. So they've been doing technical studies. They've been getting in touch with SpaceX saying, what about this? What about that? You know, so again, I think this is very important, but I don't think it's going to solve it because it's just going to make everything slightly better, you know, or slightly not, slightly not as bad as it might have been, but still bad. Um, so um, this is very, very important. Uh, and it's coming to a key stage at the moment because those reports have been published. They're going to a key UN committee next week. Um, so this is a very important work, um, but again, not everything. Uh, and, and it's hard for people like yourselves to think, well, you know, what can we do about that? Um, so another possibility could be um, litigate. So again, this is a very American thing, um, but potentially, there could be a growing thing in, in, uh, in Britain and Europe. Uh, you can see here I'm um, uh, channeling Arian Brockovich. Um, wonderful. If you haven't seen it, it's a great film, so do go and see it. Uh, but in America, they're quite used to the idea of so-called class action lawsuits. That if you feel that some uh, company or, or, or corporation is, is damaging you in some way that they should not, then you can sue them. Um, but you don't have to do it as a poor individual. You can get together as as, um, as a class action, as as it were. So, but the trouble with that is that has a, a a good track record within one country at a time, and especially in the U.S. There's no tradition of doing that across countries. I mean, I really don't see how uh, uh, an annoyed French astronomer can sue an American company or a British company. It's just not going to work. Um, uh, now, there is within uh, the UN treaties, there is a so-called liability convention, but it's very weak and loose and it's only ever been used once. So what you're seeing in the bottom picture there are some Canadians who are looking for the remains of a Russian satellite which crashed into northern Canada. Um, uh, in the 1980s, I think, quite a while ago. Uh, and, it, and it contained a nuclear reactor. So they were very cross about this. And so um, the Canadian government actually sued the Russian government. Uh, and it took years, but eventually um, the Russian government paid the Canadian government's money. But it can only be done between one government and another. And it's only ever happened once. Um, so maybe litigation is possible, but um, you know, I don't hold my breath really. So finally, the thing that I think is, is actually, um, at least in the long term, the most important, which is regulation. Uh, now, there's a strange paradox here because um, you know, many people who are involved in space science will tell you that it's, it has very tedious regulations and it's really hard getting a launch license and so on, which is true, uh, but those things are all controlled nationally and it is very petty fogging and difficult to get your permission to, to, to launch. But there's the controls, um, but the sort of questions you're asked don't take into account the sort of thing we're talking about at all. Um, and um, they don't, um, and, and they're very strictly within one country and they don't solve the, the problem that um, what you've just allowed your company to do in your country is, is annoying some people in a different country. Um, uh, and so I, my feeling is that um, uh, as the, what people are calling new space, you know, commercial space activity and things really burgeoning, as that takes off, the regulatory framework that we have, which as I say is nationally quite tight and internationally very, very loose. Um, it's not fit for purpose, basically. So I'm pretty certain it has to change. Uh, and I'm reasonably confident that it will do but the question is whether uh, it will do fast enough um, uh, to stop things being screwed up anyway. Um, now, um, you can see stuff there at the bottom about the law of the sea. That's because I think there's a very nice analog um, between um, where we are now and where the law of the sea was um, about 1970. So it used to be that um, 
every country had a narrow strip of water around it that was its, its own territory and everybody else keep off. And that's like air spaces for us today. But the open seas were meant to be free for all. It was the freedom of the seas. Uh, and during the 20th century, that broke down as you know, we got the Cod Wars, people were squabbling over mineral rights on, on the ocean floor, uh, and it started getting really nasty. Uh, and basically people realized that something had to be done. So there was a massive convention set up by the United Nations and it took several years, but the law of the sea was completely transformed and two bodies with real teeth that were international bodies were set up. One is the International Seabed Authority and the other one is the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. So my guess, sorry, this is getting a bit dry and legalistic by the end here, but my guess is that that's where we will be heading. Um, but um, how are we going to get there and whether and all those dozens of companies will have screwed things up before we get there uh, um, is, is, is the real worry. Um, so I hope the ending wasn't too depressing. Think back to the beginning bit and remember and have a nice warm glow for how important astronomy is. And I hope you agree with all that. Um, but I think that's all I've got for you. So uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you for that, Andy. That was uh, uh, definitely thought provoking, uh, but probably a bit scary for uh, for anybody that's not not heard the uh, the numbers before, uh, the numbers of satellites that are planned, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm I'm not sure what that means for how, how many of uh, our astronomy Im images will be getting photobombed over the the, the coming years. But uh, I'll, I'll maybe save a, a question on that for uh, uh, for for near the uh, the end of the. The questions because there's a few others in at the moment uh, so if you're willing to start off with the, the, the questions just now you okay with that yeah yeah, yeah. sure uh, so the first one is from sam robinson and uh, the question is what is the plan for these satellites at the end of their working life are they going to be de-orbited boosted to a higher orbit and forgotten about or just forgotten about period uh, that, that's a very interesting question uh, and <laughs> quite a complicated one. Um, so um, um, this is part of the battle between OneWeb and and, uh, and Starlink is, uh, is the relevant thing here. So the OneWeb guys have a slightly higher orbit, um, which means that they're, they're, they've mostly been worrying about the debris problem rather than the, the sky pollution problem. Uh, and they've always said, you know, so we our probability of causing um, debris problems because we're higher up and there's more space is much less, um, but they just stay there forever. Um, Starlink, um, partly in response to everybody, you know, understood that being in a really low orbit, um, they were they were going to um, maximise the risk of of collisions and leftover bits and so on. So they have always had a plan to uh, to deorbit and uh, and let drag take things back down um but um that means that that's good in some ways but on the other hand it means that they're always their plan is to always keep replacing them so something like every year 10 percent of their fleet uh, uh deorbits and burns up and then they send up some more um so that's quite good for trying to minimize the debris problem but it's about, about as bad as you can get for um, the satellite pollution problem because they're particularly bright and annoying when they're on the way up before they settled into their final orbit. Um, so yeah, people are talking about this, um, uh, but it's not clear there's a kind of perfect solution yet. Okay, that's fine. Uh, going on to the next question. Uh, we've got Peter Watts from the, the Aberdeen Society. Is there any fund similar to that for decommissioning offshore platforms for removing defunct satellites? Um, no, but another, these are, these are jolly good questions. <laughs> um, so, 
Um, no, there isn't, but you probably um, heard um, uh, just a few weeks ago, there was a, a company, international company called Astroscale, who launched up um, uh, a device that was meant for collecting de defunct satellites and dragging them back to, to Earth. Um, now, and people have got other plans for different ways to do it. Um, um, but at the moment, there's, there's a financial problem and a legal problem with that. There is no law of salvage in space. The official legal position is that even after a satellite becomes dead, it remains the property of the company or the country that launched it. And you're not allowed to go, um, excuse me, and drag it away and take it away. That's um, against the current law. So I think that's one example of something that has to change. And indeed, there's no um, funds to specifically support this. I think a company like Astroscale, and by the way, um, in Scotland, Sky Aurora have some similar plans. Um, they, they think they might get into sort of salvage. So some companies are betting on the idea that eventually there might be something like one of those decommissioning funds and, you know, and governments or others will pay them to go and collect satellites and drag them down. But at the moment, uh, those are just experiments. There is no such fund um, and it's actually illegal to um, touch anybody else's satellite. Okay. Uh question here uh, from David Orr. Uh, first of all, he's saying thank you very much for the interesting talk. The uh, question for you is, with so many satellites, doesn't such a large number present an actual problem of them colliding with each other or suffering damage from debris? Is there a limit to the number and them becoming a victim of their success? Um, it, it, that's absolutely correct. I mean, and it's, um, but um, it's not a sort of sudden threshold. It's not like below a certain number of satellites are all right. And if you go above a certain number, suddenly they start crashing into each other. As you put more and more up, you gradually increase the probability of colliding. Uh, but what's worse um, is that um, when you have some collisions, if you gradually build up the bits of debris, then you increase again the probability of collision. So you, you get a kind of slow runaway, um, but it's not that one collision will trigger a sudden catastrophic runaway. It's a bit like the, the problem of boiling the frog, as they um, say, you know, you, you put, this is horrible, but people do say this, you put a frog in water and gradually heat it up. It doesn't realize it's going to die <laughs> because the water is getting gradually warmer and it doesn't notice so until it's too late. Um, and the same thing is the problem here, that it's just gradually getting worse. And yes, absolutely, you could make things eventually almost unusable for, for everybody. Okay. Uh, so next question is from Eric Walker. Uh, and he's, he's pointing out something that I've uh, certainly experienced. He's had issues uh, with astrophotography with increasing satellite activity. However, I've also found processing techniques and modified processing techniques uh, which take out the streaks. Uh, and he, he's obviously pointing out if things get worse, though, will that be able, will, will these techniques be able to remove the, uh, the effect of the satellites? And this kind of leads on to the question I was going to ask, so I'll, I'll add it in as an extra here. Uh, obviously, the, uh, the professional telescopes will have uh, probably more computing power at their, uh, at their disposal to try and uh, remove the effects of the streaks afterwards. But has there been any sort of, I suppose, assessment as to how many satellites uh, are needed in orbit flying around before it then becomes almost impossible for the the normal sort of operation of say a wide field professional telescope. Yeah, so um, this is where yeah, the, the working groups that I referred to, this is the, exactly the sort of thing that they're working very hard on. Um, um, but the key thing to say here is that um, it, if you're trying to make uh, a beautiful image of you know, M101 or something, then it's annoying, but you can get around it with the computer power, or you can take another picture a bit later without the streaks in and combine them. Yeah, there's ways to do it. 
And in some professional applications, um, that might be much the same, but it, it still wastes taxpayers' money because you have to pay programmers to write those programs. You have to buy more computers to run that software and do the processing. Um, so this is a, a classic example of the, uh, the tragedy of the commons because it causes a problem that costs us, that means you, the taxpayer, money to fix it, right? That we didn't need to do. Um, so that's one thing. But the other thing, if it's not just a pretty picture, if you've got an image and um, so, you know, I showed the streaks and I showed you how a near earth object will actually appear as a streak. Um, if, uh, if the satellite happens to sort of zip over exactly the thing you're looking for or goes over the top of a very faint galaxy, no image processing can get that back. It's, uh, there's a bright light on top of it. You just won't see it. So some things can be recovered in software and some can't. So in a case like that, if this, and that's the Hubble Space Telescope image I showed you as a classic example, that have been pointing at something in the middle, um, but it's gone. All you can do is repeat that exposure. Um, and again, you know, who's paying for that, right? Um, so uh, it, there's, there's limits to this. And for the radio astronomers, it is almost impossible when they get obliterated and just, the calculation that the SKA people have done is that um, um, the, the current generation of Starlink satellites, let alone the 42,000 or the 100,000, uh, will make all their observations 20% longer. Um, you know, and that's already you know, a billion dollar project. So that's costing you the taxpayer and, uh, and, and another $200 million. Yeah, no, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> you can look as hard as you want, but there's, there's, there's no particular good news in it, is there? No. no. Okay. No. So you know, but, but um, I'm see. I think I was preaching to the choir here because, of course, if you ask these sort of questions you know, on Twitter or whatever, then many astronomers say, "Oh God, this is awful." But lots of other people will say, "Well, we're going to connect up those people in Africa," or you know, "I need this to uh, to play League of Legends or whatever." It's more important, you know. Uh, so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's a whole list of uh, comments here from uh, Vicky. Uh, sorry, Vicky, if, if I'm struggling to find the question and amongst it, uh, I've, I've had a read through it and I, I think basically she's agreeing with uh, uh, everything you're saying and uh, is uh, suitably uh, concerned. Uh, uh, so she said uh, it's fab to find out about it and raise the awareness. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, sorry, Vicky, if, I, if I've missed the question and amongst that, uh, feel free to uh, stick another thing in the chat and I'll get to it in a minute or two. Uh, question here from Neil McLean. Is there any potential for creating Earth orbit escape lanes for future exploration launches, uh, a bit like the airways on Earth? Um. It, well, it's hard to say. I mean, especially you could have reserved orbits, um, uh, it, which might help for the space observations, uh, observations by uh, I know, exploration satellites, um, and to say, you know, particular orbits you're not allowed in. Um, also, by the way, in a geostationary orbit, this is more or less done because the, the, uh, um, there are fewer combinations of um, because they're all the same distance, there are a few combinations of orbits, uh, but but it's very popular up in geostationary orbit. So the um, you know things are allocated slots, as it were. So that would be harder to do in low, low Earth orbit, but not impossible. But again, that wouldn't help the the problem of viewing from the ground. Yeah. Okay. Uh... Uh, one here from Stephen Chapman. Presumably, presumably, if your images are photobombed, you can Photoshop them out. Uh, and I mean, automatically, is that realistic? I think you've you've probably kind of touched upon that. But who yeah, who, exactly. who automatic can you make it and uh, and it be successful? Um, uh, yeah. So I think the key thing there, as I said, is that uh, for some purposes you can and you can make it fairly automatic, um, but uh, cost money to, to do it. 
Uh, and there are some um, things for which that simply won't help because once you've um, you know, scratched out a bit of the image, you can't get it back except by taking the picture again. Okay. Uh, Eric Walker's uh, made the comment, we, we seem to be creating a cataract so we can't see clearly outside our world. Yeah, I, I think that's probably quite a good uh, description there. Yeah, um, yes, it is. Yes, I like that. Yeah. Might have, I might have to steal that. <laughs> that, that, that'll be in the next book, uh, perhaps. Uh, 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 Vicky's confirmed that there was no question. She was just joining you and having a rant. So that's uh, that's good news. Good. Uh, okay, I, I, I think here's here, here's one that's kind of touched upon, but it's a, a specific question from uh, Carol. I, I, I think you've covered this, but isn't there a very real danger of these satellite trails obscuring a potentially deadly uh, near-Earth object or asteroid or something, uh, making it difficult for us to do anything about it? Um, yeah, that's a, a real danger. I think, it, to be honest, it's not a very large one because most such things, you would hopefully catch them another time. Um, but it is, but it's not... It's not a non-zero possibility. It is, it is a real possibility. Okay. Right. So that, that's the last question on things I can see. Can I just check with yourself, Ian, uh, that as host, uh, there aren't any questions that have been directed your, di uh, your direction for getting asked? No, nope, you've got everything. Okay, that's great. Uh, so... I think this is the point where uh, uh, I need to thank you very much for uh, taking the trouble to uh, uh, join us this evening and, and, and give it a fascinating but somewhat worrying uh, talk for uh, for Caithness Astronomy Group that uh, has been joined obviously by a number of other societies. So uh, that, that, I suppose that's the one one of the big advantages with doing these sort of things online that it, it manages to capture a bigger audience all at the one time. Uh, but uh, on behalf of Case Ness Astronomy Group, uh, I'd like to say thank you, and we're going to send you uh, a, a few a few goodies as uh, a small token of our appreciation. Uh, I'm not I'm not sure if you're seeing that, but uh, well, there's the obligatory Case Ness Astronomy Group mug. But I I know the the, the thing you're probably going to be uh, enjoying a bit more. And uh, you, you can't see it there because it's uh, Zoom is good at obliterating things out. But uh, for the, for those that can't see, uh, we've got a little package from uh, that we've organised with our friends at John of Goats Brewery to uh, to send your direction. So uh, oh, I'm, I'm sure that will help uh, when it comes time shortly for a, a birthday, I believe. Uh, so you you. Yes, well, yes. Excellent. We'll maybe see if we can get it there in time uh, for that, and uh, and uh, you 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 can treat that as a uh, as a happy birthday wish as well uh, from uh, us in the, in the north of Scotland, and perhaps sometime in the in the future uh, we we can organise for you to have a a, a venture back north uh, to pay as a visit, and uh, maybe get grilled by some of the school kids again. Well, that would be fantastic. Thank you for having me. Well, th thank you very much uh, for for giving us your time. Uh, the The next part of the uh, the event is a, a run through a number of images, and Andy, you're more than welcome to stay tuned for the next half hour or so and enjoy some oh, views. Yeah, or, or you you can leave. Uh, we, we, we won't take it personally. Uh, we, we know you're a you're, you're a busy man, so uh, uh, you 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 can choose as you wish. But uh, feel free to to stay tuned and enjoy the the views from the north of Scotland that have been captured by uh, uh, a number of people uh, uh, up here over the past year. Okay, that, thanks very much, Andy. So I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, let me just get myself organised. Okay. So.
Can I just double check with the, the, the folk out there? Maybe John. Yep, I can see you in the video. A thumbs up. You're telling me that you can see uh, the first photograph in the presentation. Can I just double check as well? Can you see my cursor moving around the screen? Excellent. That's fine because that's the way it should be. Uh, so I shall now uh, move on and run through uh, a, a number of images that have been taken uh, in the north of Scotland over the past year or so uh, from uh, members from uh, mostly Caithness Astronomy Group, but there are a few images uh, from uh, further south, uh, I'm, I'm delighted to say. And I, I think what these do is they, they illustrate quite clearly the the benefits certainly to amateur astronomers of nice dark skies. Uh, so skies that are uh, very low in uh, the effect of light pollution. And at the moment, uh, they're, they're not seeing uh, any real adverse effects uh, through satellites getting into the shot. Uh, I should maybe point out for this particular image here, uh, in the top right hand side, that's a shooting star. Uh, that was uh, captured by myself. Uh, one of only a few that I've ever managed to catch uh, on camera. They seem to be quite shy when I get the camera out, uh, despite the fact I've taken tens of thousands of photographs, I suspect, to the night sky. Uh, I've probably got no more than uh, a handful or so uh, decent captures of shooting stars, uh, which I know many others have more success, so I think that's really just down to my luck in this particular <laughs> case. So, right back, I think two days before the official lockdown started uh, back in March last year, uh, myself and a few other members of Keith Ness Astronomy Group got treated to this view uh, at Loch Calder in the, 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 the middle of uh, Caithness, so fairly far away from any towns or villages. And really the only light pollution we had was from the stars, from the aurora on the northern horizon, and from the zodiacal light that you can see stretching up from the horizon through Venus up towards the, the Pleiades. Uh, and you can probably also see in this image the, the Milky Way mm -hmm. stretching across the sky there. So. Uh, quite a, a tremendous view uh, to behold. I, I think it, it it probably seemed even better that night because the 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 PT loch was so uh, flat cam that it, it felt like it was almost doubling the number of stars that you could see because uh, they could be seen looking down the way as well as up into the sky. Uh, and it's certainly a night I'll not forget, and I suspect. The, uh, the handful of other uh, astronomy group members that were with me that night uh, will uh, probably feel the same way. But it, it can be quite tremendous when we get nice clear skies in the north of Scotland. So uh, here's some other images from shortly after lockdown that I took from a back garden. Uh, these are telescopic ones. And even in uh, one of the biggest towns in the north of Scotland, in uh, Thurzo, uh, the, the skies are dark enough, they're uh, bottle four uh, sort of uh, level. Uh, from there, uh, it is quite easy for imaging uh, through telescopes uh, to get views such as this. Uh, so these were taken with a small telescope from my gar uh, back garden in the town. So you'll probably recognise the, uh, the whirlpool galaxy, is that what it's called? I think that's right, in the bottom right. And then you've got Messier 81 and 82. Uh, and then uh, you've got Globular Cluster M13 there in the top right. So dark skies makes it so much easier for uh, seeing these sort of objects with a telescope and certainly for imaging them. But shortly after uh, what seemed to be a week or two of 
uh, nice clear dark skies at the beginning of lockdown. Of course, in the far north of Scotland, the twilight uh, uh, summer evenings start to uh, uh, take effect and you don't get full uh, astronomical darkness. So in the north of Caithness, from about the 26th of April, we don't see astronomical darkness. And shortly afterwards, uh, telescope views tend to be swapped for, uh, for looking for things like noctilucent clouds and other bright objects in the sky. So here's a photograph taken from Duncan's Head, and you can see the noctilucent clouds in the background. And hopefully you can see a little smudge here, which is Comet Neowise. Now, the downside to the, the bright nights in the north of Scotland was that that comet, which was very prominent further south, uh, didn't stand out too well against the twilight skies along the, the north coast of Scotland. Uh, so that was, uh, that was a shame because uh, here's the best image that I managed to get. Uh, it, it, it was a particularly bright and nice comet, and certainly in darker uh, places with darker skies further south, uh, they were getting tremendous views. Uh, in fact, uh, even down in uh, Moray, this is an image by Alan Took, uh, down in the Elgin area, you can see that he, he was quite lucky down there with uh, the sky being clear at a time during July when it was a bit darker. Uh, I, I was a bit less fortunate with the uh, the timing of things versus the, the cloud cover. Uh, but you can see the comet Neobis standing out there against the, uh, the the northern the bright northern sky. And the noctilucent clouds are, are really quite stunning in this image. Uh, but if you think that's good, uh, there's a, an even better image of the comet. Uh, taken through a telescope this time. Uh, but if you like this noctilucent cloud image, I think you'll agree that this one uh, uh, probably beats it hands down. In fact, uh, I would uh, quite comfortably say it's the best image I've seen from the, the past year. Uh, the, the colours are amazing. The, the trees definitely add to the scene and the detail in the noctilucent clouds is uh, uh, it was really uh, wonderful to look at. So uh, uh, well done, Alan, uh, for catching that. And uh, thank you for letting me share that this evening uh, with others, others that are viewing tonight. So after the summertime and the Noctilus coin season had passed, uh, the Darker Nights came. And I'm delighted to say with the Darker Nights came a number of Aurora displays. So here's uh, a particularly good one in moonlight from uh, Thurzo. So you can see Thurzo Castle on the right. And it was taken by John Hilton. Uh, so this was in the, I think, early autumn, if I remember right. And uh, the, the, there was a, a few Caithness Astronomy Group members out that night. And we were scattered along the shoreline at uh, uh, distances far greater than two metres. Uh, so, I mean, it's quite easily, easy to socially distance uh, when you're out and about in uh, remote areas. Uh, in fact, when you're taking photographs, you, you probably want to keep out each other's way anyway. But there was a number of us out that night captur capturing the uh, Fab Aurora display. Uh, and there's a, an image I took from the shoreline uh, just down below where uh, Aurora, uh, John took his Aurora panorama. So you can see the same two boats on the uh, on the horizon there uh, being imaged. Fantastic uh, display of Aurora, that one. And another one here, uh, again captured by Alan Took. And uh, uh, I, I, I'm kind of hoping Alan's tuning in tonight, uh, maybe at the end, or if he wants to jump in just now, he can explain the headline that I've put at the, at the top of the uh, the photo here. Uh, Aurora photography becomes an extreme sport. Uh, I don't know if you're there, Alan, and want to explain the background, uh, but if not, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll maybe mention it later on, uh, the, the, the little story behind it. I have to say it's, uh, uh, it's, 
it, it, it was both amusing and uh, enlightening, uh, and it's something that I'll I'll be watching out myself for in the, in the future. Uh, so another person that is regularly out photographing the Aurora at any opportunity is Dennis Pichinsky, uh, and he's set up at Tarbot Ness. And uh, I have to say, Dennis manages to capture uh, probably more Aurora displays uh, than anybody else in the in the Highlands. I think it's a combination of uh, uh, he, he's quite lucky where he is with the clouds. Uh, it seems, and whenever the sky is dark and there's gaps in the clouds, uh, he's always got his eyes and uh, telescope and camera gear out ready to uh, point at anything interesting. So uh, we've got a beautiful, colourful display of the Aurora here captured by Dennis. Uh, so just a, another Aurora one uh, from a bit later on in the autumn. Uh, again, lovely colours there, and that was from uh, Dunnett Beach in uh, Keith Ness. So this autumn has been quite, uh, this past autumn has been quite good, uh, but obviously we're all hoping that with a upturn in Aurora activity, uh, we'll be in a position to see more Aurora uh, in the, the coming winter ahead. Uh, interestingly enough, I got an alert in uh, just as the talk started, saying that there is strong aurora activity just now. Uh, now, unfortunately, Keith Ness is uh, clouded out at the moment, but I know that people down uh, Aberdeen, Moray Coast direction, I think you might be okay for seeing the aurora. So uh, uh, I look forward to seeing photographs from down that neck of the woods if you're, you're fortunate enough to uh, keep the clear skies for a bit longer. Now, what, what do amateur astronomers do when they don't have uh, holidays to spend money on and the like? Well, they, they tend to get te tempted to buy new bits of equipment. So I've got a few photographs here uh, where myself and another member of the astronomy group purchased some new kit and uh, we've been uh, using it over the winter months to test it out and uh, get used to using it. So at the top, you'll recognise uh, one of these CMOS astronomy cameras and uh, that uh, Neil McLean uh, was making good use of over the uh, over the, the, the darker uh, months just past and I purchased uh, the, the equivalent of a uh, 180 millimeter lens uh, but it's specially designed really for astrophotography uh, it's like a cross between a mini telescope and a, uh, and a camera lens uh, so Here's the, uh, uh, the the results of the initial uh, trials over that period. So you can see the top right, the uh, the Ring Nebula and Lyra photographed by Neil. So uh, fabulous result. Uh, I'm sure you'll be really pleased with that, Neil. Uh, just starting off on your astrophotography uh, adventures. Uh, that, that, that's, that's a great result, that. And for myself, uh, you can see the wide field uh, view there of the Orion Nebula with uh, Horsehead Nebula peaking in the top left and the Flame Nebula there. Uh, I'm not very good at image processing. I think there's a far better image in amongst the data that I got, but uh, that's as good as I managed to get it after about 15 minutes. And uh, uh, to be honest, my patience runs a bit thin uh, after about that length of time. Uh, but uh, topically, you'll notice a couple of satellite trails in the, the bottom of the, the image. So the, the wider the field of view, uh, I suppose the more chance there is of capturing one of them photobombing this scene. And there's one of the Andromeda galaxy uh, again through that. Uh, it's designed to be 180 millimetres uh, focal length, but the camera being a crop sensor uh, equates to about 290 uh, millimetres in, in focal length. So. Uh, quite a good size for imaging some of these bigger objects in the sky. So for those of you uh, who don't have sophisticated setups, uh, I had a try over the over the period with my smartphone. So I've 
I've got a, a decent smartphone, but it is definitely not uh, top of the range. Uh, so Pixel 3a, which I think is about £400 worth at the moment, £350, £400. Uh, so there's probably many of you out there with similar sort of phone. And if you get the right astrophotography app, you can take slightly longer exposures of, of the sky. And these three images that I've taken here were all handheld with that smartphone. So here's one of the Aurora display at uh, uh, Thurzo uh, Bay. So you can see those two ships again that I mentioned earlier. Here's my camera, digital SLR set up to take the, uh, the images that I was taking. Uh, and you can see it's a, it's a perfectly reasonable image of the Aurora. It was quite a bright Aurora display, uh, but it captured it fairly well. Not to lose in clouds, it really did capture well. Uh, you can see that in the bottom left scene. And surprisingly, uh, I was able to capture the constellation of Orion there uh, in, in a dark spot in Caithness. Now, I, I wasn't convinced that that was going to be terribly re, uh, readily achievable with a smartphone, but there you go. It does, does show you that uh, that sort of technology has advanced enough these days that you can capture something meaningful. And of course, if you're imaging the moon, uh, then you can use the lights of a smartphone, hold it up to the eyepiece, and you can get really quite spectacular images of bright objects like, like the moon, showing details of craters and the like. Towards the end of the, the, the year, uh, we had the conjunction of Saturn and Jupiter, and uh, I know there was quite a few in uh, Keithness Astronomy Group were, were out trying to capture it. The, the weather didn't play ball on the uh, the, the night of closest, closest approach, but in the week leading up to it, when they were starting to get fairly close, uh, it, there, there were gaps in the cloud that if you were uh, set up and quick enough, you could manage to capture the two side by side, so Saturn and uh, Jupiter there. And here's the best image I managed to get through a, a telescope. Uh, so there's a simulated uh, uh, eyepiece view there. It, essentially, it was a, a rectangular uh, image uh, with uh, Saturn and Jupiter side by side in the field of view. Uh, unfortunately, the, the moons are quite faint. So to keep the exposure right for the planets looking decent, the, the moons are barely visible. Now, uh, the advantage of uh, the dark skies in the north of Scotland, well, the, the bottom line is there's, there's lots of stars to see. It's, it's quite uh, it's quite impressive if you get to that location. And there's a view here on the left of the, uh, the Milky Way, and you can see the, the winter hexagon there on the right-hand side. Uh, I don't normally include myself in photographs if I can avoid it, uh, but I thought a selfie uh, on a dark night is probably safe enough. I have been told I look best in the dark. Uh, and you can clearly see the winter hexagon there. You see the hexagon shape in the sky uh, and the prominent constellation, very recognisable constellation of Orion as uh, part of that hexagon. Uh, and some of you might recognise the Milky Way part there. You've got uh, Prickstar, Lyra, uh, Deneb there, and there's uh, lots of nebulosity showing up in the image. It was quite a misty night that night, uh, so you can see that the the, the stars are a little bit kind of bloated uh, uh, due to that uh, mistiness in the sky. But because it was particularly dark, uh, I could take a really long exposure, and the Milky Way uh, stands out really clearly there. <coughs> so another big advantage of really dark skies, uh, as uh, Dennis uh, Pajinski and Tarbot Ness will tell you, is that you can image extremely faint objects. Uh, so image is a, uh, sorry, uh, Dennis is a comet fan. Uh, any opportunity you get to, he'll be out looking at and imaging comets. And he, he does a lot of uh, useful uh, scientific measurements uh, and uh, uh, records them 
so on one night over the, the winter months, he, he managed uh, in, in one dark clear night to image 20 comets uh, with magnitude between 14 and 18. So uh, that's extremely faint stuff. Uh, and here's one of the more prominent uh, comments that he managed to image that night. And there's a select, selection of thumbnails of the other comets he imaged on that one uh, long night uh, with no cloud and very clear transparent skies. So dark skies uh, allow some real astronomy, uh, not just pretty pictures, some uh, some real good uh, work to get done, especially when you're uh, uh, knowledgeable and uh, capable like uh, Dennis is. And here, here's an image from, I believe, the last night or two. Uh, it's actually dated the 14th, so yeah, <clears throat> a couple of nights ago. Uh, I know Keith Ness, we had some really clear skies the last few nights, and this is of uh, Messier 39, and Dennis's comment, uh, which probably matched mine when I opened it, was <laughs> too many stars, it, it's uh, uh, <laughs> how, how do you get so many stars appearing in, the, in, in one image through a, a, an amateur uh, telescope, but this is a region of the Milky Way that's quite easily visible from uh, uh, from the north of Scotland, and it is amazing how many stars have been captured there. And we're not talking really, really long exposures. Uh, you can see in the bottom left here, it's 30 second exposures with a, uh, a digital SLR camera. Uh, so we are talking uh, uh, kind of normal uh, astrophotography that a lot of uh, amateurs and certainly a lot of members of uh, the, the North of Scotland groups would be carrying out. So, uh, yeah, fantastic image there from Dennis. And in another part of uh, the, the Milky Way, uh, this time in the constellation of Cassiopeia, uh, the last one was in Cygnus. This one's along uh, from it a little bit. Uh, and this is showing the, the Nova that was recently discovered there. Uh, so if anybody can spot it, they know where it is. Uh, it's actually that star there, which uh, was extremely faint up until I think mid-March time. So it increased in brightness by a, a, an incredible amount. Uh, I think the, uh, the, the star that was there previously any kind of amateur, uh, small amateur telescope would not have been able to image it. Uh, whereas uh, this was imaged, in my particular case, with the the two the new two two hundred millimeter lens and a digital SLR. Uh, so it's now at magnitude, I think, eight or nine brightness, and uh, I I could certainly see it in binoculars. And it's quite easy to find if you know where to find Messier 52, which is that one there. And for those that like doing a bit of astrophotography, you've probably heard of the Bubble Nebula, uh, which is that sort of red zone there. Uh, so it is in a, a part of the Milky Way, so there's lots of stars, but if you find uh, Messier 52 uh, and that bright star, uh, if you spot the pair over to the side of it, it's the top of those two, uh, is the, the, the Nova that has uh, recently become apparent. And we're, we're nearly at the end of the selection of photos. Uh, I just put, uh, threw the, these ones in last night uh, after uh, imaging in clear skies. Again, it's using this, this setup. And to be honest, I was just out trying to test uh, what could be achieved using it. Uh, so you, you'll see on the right hand side, again, topical again, there's a satellite trail going through the field of view and uh, you've got Messier 13, so that's the uh, globular cluster in Hercules there. Uh, so that was captured uh, using this setup. Uh, I should point out it's on a Star Adventurer uh, portable tracking mount. You've probably recognised that there in the photograph. Uh, and if you're wondering what this thing here is, it's a, a dew heater to stop the lens uh, uh, capturing or developing dew over uh, a photo session. Uh, unfortunately, that's the, the poor thing about the north of Scotland. It's 
It's very dark, but there's a lot of moisture in there, which can play havoc when you're trying to take images. Now, these other two here don't look very picturesque, but I wasn't aiming for a picturesque photograph. Uh, what I was looking for in this case was trying to image things that are a bit more extreme than I would normally have thought about imaging with a digital SLR and a lens. Uh, and the one in the bottom left is a recent Type 1A supernova that is 76 million light years distant. So you can probably see a bit of a smudge there. Uh, and the star like point is to one end of that smudge. That smudge is a, uh, a edge on spiral galaxy, and the supernova is off to one side of it. So there you have the supernova uh, visible. It's magnitude 13 or thereabouts at the moment. So that's not too bad an achievement for uh, for this setup. I should also point out, uh, as I was just testing out and not going for pretty pictures, these are single images. So it's not a stack of uh, 20 or 30. It's a single image and I haven't even processed them. Because they're uh, so close to the talk, I didn't have time to do anything. So I've just taken a single exposure and I've cropped into the, the, the part of interest. So uh, I'm sure when I stack together 20 or 30 of the images, it may turn out a little bit clearer uh, than what's showing here. But uh, as I said, uh, I just want to illustrate what was achievable. And again, another topical one here, uh, we've got a quasar. Now, uh, uh, Professor Lawrence will know all about these uh, uh, quasars. And this one is the the, the brightest one, I'm not sure, if, I'm presuming that probably the closest one to us, but it's the brightest one uh, uh, visible in the night sky. It's magnitude 13 again, and it's a staggering 2.4 billion light years distant. So when you consider that uh, uh, the, the, the photons left that on its journey to here, uh, when the, the, there was probably nothing much living on the earth at all. Uh, it's it, it a bit mind blowing uh, that uh, it's had to travel all that distance and uh, the photons have been collected by the sensor in this camera. So I, I, th I thought that's quite, quite cool. Uh, I have imaged it before and it, it, it doesn't matter what size of amateur telescope you've got, it is just a star like uh, uh, point of light. Uh, but the, the fact that I've managed to image it, just a single shot uh, with digital SLR and uh, that fairly small lens, I thought was uh, quite impressive. So uh, just to finish up, uh, just a quick reminder of the next astronomy, uh, Caithness Astronomy Group event uh, in May. And in the meantime, you may want to watch out for a gathering of planets after sunset, uh, round about the middle of May. Uh, certainly mid-May it's joined by the moon, uh, so that, that might be a good photo opportunity. And it just so happens that come, I think, the 28th of May, Mercury and Venus will be side by side, a bit like Jupiter and Saturn were a few months ago, so that if you pointed a telescope at them, then uh, they would be in the same field of view. Uh, the downside is they're going to be extremely close to the northwestern horizon. Uh, so that could be quite tricky for a lot of people trying to get that, uh, that view or that image. But certainly one to look out for if you get the chance uh, from mid-May onwards to the end of May, look out for that pairing after sunset to the northwest. And that's all I would want to share uh, with you tonight. Uh, I should maybe ask, because uh, I'm entirely clear on uh, everybody that's here tonight. Uh, Alan, uh, I, I do know what you are there. Do you want to tell the story behind the, uh, the Aurora photograph or will I embellish on it? I'm not too sure if you've even got microphone capability where you are. Uh, so. Uh, I'll, I'll give you five seconds or so to wave your hand or, or let me know what you want to do. Okay. 
So Alan is there, but uh, he, he, he's maybe on a, a set up where he's not in a position to uh, to speak. So uh, I'm, I'm sure he would tell the uh, the story in a much more interesting and uh, funny way. But uh, the, the the bottom line was he was out photographing that uh, shot of the Aurora, lovely scene from a, a field, I think, near where he lives. Uh, and uh, partway through uh, the imaging session, he realised he was in a field uh, with close company from a rather large bull. Uh, and that's where the comment comes about the uh, uh, Aurora photography being uh, a, a, an extreme sport. I, I, I suspect uh, it, you had to make quite a hasty retreat to safety out with the field uh, once he'd realised uh, who was there with him. So uh, uh, anyway, th thanks again for uh, those that have shared the uh, their images so uh, so that I could show them tonight. Uh, I think you'll agree that uh, there are some spectacular ones there, some quite amazing shots uh, that have been uh, produced by uh, people in the, the, the clubs across the north of Scotland. And uh, I would encourage you to uh, uh, keep going out there with the camera. And if you get good shots, uh, share them at the, the various meetings. Uh, it's always good to see what others are managing to capture and the, the views that might be missed by those people that are in areas that are unfortunately clouded out on uh, particular nights. Uh, so I think on that note, I shall uh, finish off. Uh, I, I should maybe check, was there any any questions or things come in while, uh, while I was wittering on there? Uh, I don't know if uh, Ian or John, have you noticed yeah. anything coming in in the comments that uh, uh, requires Andy, any sort of answering? Andy's asking you for the light curve. <laughs> 3C273, it varies all the time. So you, um, I think you should observe it every week and give us the light curve. Uh, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that, that, that'll be problematic, I suspect, because of the weather. Uh, one, one thing you're not maybe be aware of, Andy, uh, and, and this is a story that's going to bore uh, uh, some of the KTS astronomy group because I've told it a few times. So I'm going to give the uh, the abridged version. Uh, you you remember the uh, the supernova, the Type One A supernova that happened in May '82 in 2014, and it was discovered by the people in. Uh, one of the colleges in London, I believe. Do you remember that one? Uh, in, in 82, did you say? Yeah. Yes, May 82, uh, the Cigar Galaxy. Oh, in M82. Yeah. Um, sounds familiar. I don't quite remember it, but yeah, yeah. go on. Well, uh, myself and another Keith Ness astronomy group member who lives just around the corner from me, uh, Chris Sinclair, we imaged that supernova the night before it was discovered. But uh, Chris's photographs didn't turn out quite as he had hoped, so he didn't spend any time in them uh, for a couple of days. Uh, and I was busy, uh, so it was actually the day after I realised that I'd photographed a, a supernova, a pre-discovery image of the supernova, uh, which I, I thought was, was really quite cool that I'd managed to... Uh, uh, spot and uh, image the uh, supernova and unknown to me when I looked at the, the images two days later uh, I, I was actually testing out a new camera so I was comparing the images from the old camera with the new one and spotted this extra star and it was at that point I thought that's a bit strange I wonder if it, could that be a supernova so of course what do you do you type into Google as you always do to figure out what's what it could be and uh, I found out that the uh, the folk in uh, London had uh, discovered that the night before uh, I had looked at the images and spotted something uh, unusual there. Uh, and if, as, as I've been uh, uh, told by uh, many people, if you ever photograph galaxies, you have to take, check the images on the night uh, to make sure there's no, uh, no supernova there. Uh, but I, I wasn't too worried about that, but you mentioned the light curve light curve. One of the things I did do is I had a basic uh, 
uh, diffraction grating. Not quite as uh, uh, the same as the one you mentioned in your talk. Uh, it, it's, it's one that's just 100, 100 lines per millimetre, I think. So it gives a, a, a fairly bright spectrum, good for amateur kit. Uh, and what I did was I got a spectrum of that supernova and I was able to pick out the, the silicon absorption uh, line in it and work out the, uh, the the speed of the expansion of the, the shell. So I've got to say, I found that quite cool that an amateur from a back garden in the north of Scotland was able to almost discover a supernova and was able to do some scientific measurements all with really quite rudimentary equipment. Uh, so I, I suppose that's one of these uh, uh, bits of encouragement for people that like spending hours out observing the night sky. There's unusual things out there to see and observe, uh, and, and it could be great fun if you spot something unusual. Uh, but as for uh, doing the light curve, uh, I, I think the weather would be the biggest challenge for, for doing that for me, and the, the nights are not going to be dark for much longer, unfortunately. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I would be tempted otherwise, I suspect, uh, if, uh, if, if, if it was much easier uh, and there were guaranteed uh, clear skies. Okay, so Love is there the any, any other ones you've spotted, Ian? Nope, uh, just lots of comments saying thank you very much for uh, a nice talk, uh, Andy, and lots of nice photos, Gordon. Right. That's, that's fantastic. So uh, once again, Andy, thank you very much for uh, agreeing to give a, a talk for the uh, Keith's Astronomy Group tonight. And obviously, that has managed to uh, get to all the other North of Scotland uh, clubs. I'm sure they'll have uh, enjoyed the opportunity to, to hear it as well. Uh, and I hope, uh, like you, that uh, something good can be sorted out on the, uh, the satellite front. Uh, but I, I think it's going to take time and a lot of effort from uh, many people to, to achieve that. So I think that's time for me to sign off for tonight. Uh, I hope everybody's enjoyed it and thank you all for joining in and we'll, we'll see you again at a future event. <laughs>